Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and Kevin Curley is with me. Kevin, what's up? Just getting done reading Howard Marks' latest memo, talking about silly season when it comes to campaigns and all the money being given away in terms of promises. So we'll see what happens post-election. But there are a lot of gifts being given out by both candidates to anybody and everybody for a vote. I'm sure there is. Well, let's uh, let's set the uh, topics for today. We'll we'll do our planning topic, which is always timely on tax and what is tax advice versus tax planning and some strategy around that. And then we'll jump into our last segment, which is a little bit of role playing with a few characters. So let's kick it off with tax planning. Why don't you uh, why don't you lead the way in that? Yeah, so unlike your tax return, um, as far as filing with the IRS, there's something else that your, say, financial advisor or your wealth advisor, depending on what they consider their title to be, can do for you, which is tax planning. And so it's really looking at what is the reality today and what it could be using different strategies. So some of it can involve education, so explaining how different types of taxes are assessed, which investment products are taxed a certain way. Um, but otherwise, it's reviewing your tax return and going, what if? Uh, what if we did it this way? Or what if we did it that way? So some of the low hanging fruit that uh, I'm sure Tom will be happy to jump in on is tax loss harvesting. Um, that's a classic one. Investing in municipal bonds. That's a good one as well. And that's especially prevalent for those in high income tax states or those just who have high income and paying a large amount. So you can get tax free income and that can make a big difference. So when you see how much you're paying on that, that's ordinary income tax switching to municipal bond, that could be a suggestion that you're wealth advisor comes up with you by reviewing your tax return. Um, and this is in contrast when it comes to tax advice. Your CPA, they're collecting the information, they're following the rules. Oftentimes, they're telling you what to do and how to do it. Um, your financial advisor is going to review it and say, well, what if we did it this way instead? Yeah, this is, you know, this, I, I don't know if it's if it's an industry thing or what's going on, but, you know, CPAs are more, um, how do I say this? Uh they are more rank and file these days. They just are, they just answer questions as it comes. I feel like they don't provide a lot of strategy when it comes to to tax planning. They give you, you know, you give them your tax return you give them your W2, whatever it may be, mortgage interest, property taxes, and they go ahead and and submit it. So I get a lot of clients ask me, well, why don't I just use TurboTax? And I think it actually makes a lot of sense for a lot of situations um, if your taxes are pretty pretty black and white because a lot of CPAs aren't actually doing getting into tax strategy and it really really bothers me. So what our approach is well to, to give them a little credit, right? Where are all the creative accountants? Yeah, I don't know where they went. The good ones are they're they're all in jail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they worked at companies like Enron and they got to some really creative accounting. So. In that industry, creativity is not encouraged. It's very much discouraged. So follow it to the letter of the law and make sure you do it. Versus, you know, I'm not saying that we're very creative over in the wealth management side of the business, but I would say we're more creative than most accountants and we're encouraged to be. So what if and how do you design your future life? I think that that's something, a question that we deal with every day. So when it comes to what if we did this tax stuff differently or invested differently to minimize taxes, uh, very valuable planning. Yeah, well, there's there's being creative and there's also being strategic and and actually planning. And I feel like a lot of CPAs don't do the strategy part. So, you know, I think on, on our end, you know, we don't do, we don't give tax advice, but we can certainly help out with the planning process. And again, it's, there's different levels for everyone. Um, someone who's W2, it's going to be pretty straightforward. There's only so many things you can write off. Um, it's, it's pretty black and white, but if you're a business owner, there's a lot of different levels on, on how you structure different entities of your business, setting up everything from retirement plans to help, uh, your, your tax bill at the end of the year to, uh, just paying certain things, whether it's an S corp or a C corp. So there's different pros and cons on how to set things up. And I think tax planning and strategy is, is crucial. Cause like we said before, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Um, but the difference between tax planning and strategy versus tax advice and going to the CPA is, is 
two completely different things. And unfortunately, and there are a lot of good CPAs out there. I'm not throwing them all under the bus, but they're, you know, they just wait till you send them stuff at the end of the year and, and, and they, and they file it for you. So, you know, to Kevin's point, we do a lot of tax strategy and planning throughout the year as it pertains to investments and, and other items that could, that it could help you out. Yeah. And so I'm not going to go through each thing and tell you what it is because we recorded other podcasts that you can find where we go through some of these strategies. But, you know, tax planning can include things like Roth conversions. Does it make sense to do it now? Pay the taxes later. Uh, Using a backdoor Roth IRA if you're over that income limit. Uh, Deciding between using your, you know, your Roth or your traditional 401k or IRA at work or at home uh, outside of that. Uh, Whether or not using an SMA can make sense to capture some tax loss trading. same thing with, you know, does it make sense to maybe take distributions earlier from your IRA um, because you got big RMDs coming down when you get to 72 or 75 because of the changes that you're at 2.0. So modeling these things out and just think of it as what if we did it this way? Each time you think of tax planning, it's what if we just did it differently? Um, I think that that's where you can add a lot of value. And, you know, to that end, next year is the expiration of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and that's just to say that tax laws are always changing. So, Things that we recommend one year, five years later, might not be the same recommendation or might not make sense. So one of the plans, uh, you got to revisit each year. Yeah. Just re- yeah. The tax laws change. Secure Act has had a 1.0, a 2.0. It'll probably have a 3.0. And this whole tax bill is going to change based on who gets elected in November. And we have no idea who's going to be. So we can't expect what it'll be. And they got to pass a bill between three different groups. Good luck. Yeah. You know, and, and I think one thing that, that we do and can do is uh, let us quarterback it. You know, I try to get introduced to every client that I work with, but to their CPA, if they have a CPA and if they don't have a CPA, we, we, you know, usually have recommendations, but if we can be in contact with the CPA to help push and drive that strategy um, makes a big difference. Cause sometimes you don't know what questions to ask or, or, or not to ask. Uh, we also, you know, technology is, I mean, we got technology for everything now. We use a, a software called Holista Plan, which is really, really nice. It lays out basically, you know, here's what you made, here's the limits on Roth conversions or IRAs or what you can c- contribute to. And it's a really essentially a one pager that can just keep track with the tax code. Again, it's not tax advice and we're not filing the taxes, but it helps us just guide through the process throughout the year just to make sure that you're in the best possible position because like you said, that the 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 tax Trump's tax law is sunsetting at the end of next year. It's going to be very fluid depending on what happens in November. And, you know, I don't know if taxes are going up, but I can pretty much guarantee they're not, they're not going down. So it's, it's, it's super important to have a good tax strategy, especially the more complicated your situation is. And you might not even know that it's complicated. There could be real estate inheritance. So there's a lot that comes up that has a major, major tax implication and sometimes getting ahead of it, before those liquidity events or uh, inheritance events happen um, could save you a lot in the long run. Yeah, and that's that's one of the goals of tax planning is to reduce your lifetime tax bill or possibly a multi-generational tax bill. Who does it make sense to pay the taxes, right? So if you're currently retired and let's say you're in your mid seventies and you've got a couple million dollars, you're taking RMDs, uh, but that's your only form of income. It could make sense for you to convert some of that to Roth or to take out bigger distributions instead of, let's say your kids who are in their fifties in their peak earning years, getting taxed at a much higher rate. So if you look at it, the family tax rate being in the twenties, as opposed to being in the forties, you want you and your descendants to keep the much most as possible. Uh, it might make sense to take more out and your CPA might say, well, you don't want to do that because you'll owe more tax this year. We want to look at the long term, the bigger wins of, well, what is the lifetime tax bill going to look like? And to your point about Holista Plan, it is a great tool. Software can be really helpful. One of the ways I find it to be helpful is instead of reviewing tax returns by hand and going one by one, I can do 100 a year as opposed to doing 10 a year. So it means I can provide the services to more clients as opposed to before. It took so many hours to go and look and see, well, what did they have as far as ordinary income from interest? Yeah, it, we get it as one little number on the yep, on the sheet. Yeah, so. yep. It's it's uh, AI. It's coming, Tom. It's, get ready. It's helpful. And talking about long term, that's good. That's a great point. Taxes obviously matter for you know the year that you're in, but long term planning. You know, you might not think you need estate planning, but you know if that if that lifetime exemption amount drops down to to ten million, it could even go lower. Who who knows what it's going to be? You know, anything above that, you're going to be taxed at forty percent when you pass. So. There's different strategies to help offset it, you know, trust planning, um, life insurance could be used as a great vehicle to, to offset some of that. So, 
it's um it's a it's a it's a large topic too much to cover here but point being is you know tax planning is crucial and i i personally wouldn't rely too heavily on your cpa to provide strategy because i feel a lot don't at this point and it's more just um whatever comes in they file and they move on to the next one yeah i think that's that's really helpful um and to your point about a state planning and the state taxes, when that sunsets, we're going to go from about 13 million per person as the exemption back to five and a half million. And that five and a half will be adjusted for inflation. But we've kind of seen how the government can kind of play with inflation numbers for the last five years. So that five and a half might turn into six. It might be a smaller number and it doesn't have to do. It just reverts back to the old numbers. So um, that's a pretty significant drop, especially for a married couple that had $26 million that was all going to pass tax-free to now only having 10 or 11 that's tax-free. Um, so obviously a high class problem, champagne problems, but still, you know, why pay if you don't have to, yep. um, let's try to find ways to minimize taxes. So pay all that you have to, but don't pay more than you have to. I, I like that. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's see, uh, what all these characters that we find out in the newspaper and run around the world are up to. All right. first time in a number of years um we have saw some changes so for our first role play you are jerome powell our, our good pal jerry you cut the fed funds rate by 50 basis points um what does this mean for retail investors what's next who is this tax cut for or sorry tax cut <laughs> rate cut for uh gdp is two or three percent uh labor market's okay who are you cut taxes for well, you know, I, I haven't gotten it right on the way up. I'm probably not going to get it right on the way down. And it's not a coincidence that elections are coming up in, in November and we saw the first cut. But I do think the economy is looking better. Inflation's heading in the right direction. And I don't want to hold for too much longer. So I am going to start dropping rates as I did. And we're going to look at it as the data comes in. But I expect rates to be a full percent and a half lower by this time next year. And if we can pull off this soft landing and the growth numbers stay strong and inflation doesn't take back up, I think the neutral rate might be a little bit higher than I once anticipated. And getting those rates probably closer to three and a half, four percent might be might be the new game plan. Now, I think this will help out uh, be a tailwind for the economy. It's going to help out, you know, not only retail investors. It's going to help out small businesses. The biggest line item in a PL for a small business is, is debt. That's how they grow. And most of that debt is variable and goes up as rates go up. So as rates come back down, that's going to add to the bottom line. And I'll help out the everyday consumer with loans, cheaper rates, uh, housing, more affordable housing as rates go down. But rates go down too quickly. What does that do to the demand for housing prices? So, And that's been the uh, stickiest me, part. Mr. Chairman, some people are saying that you cut the Fed funds rate because interest on the national debt is now going to be a larger line item expense than the defense budget in the upcoming yeah, year. I, is there any I, truth to that? I really screwed that one up. I had budgeted for $900 billion this year, and it's probably going to be a little over a trillion. I just had to make an $88 billion payment uh, last month on our interest carries. So, yeah, I was kind of in a bind and I really have no choice but to lower rates because yeah, 1 trillion being added just an in interest carry, uh, gets a little pricey. You know, we're over budget by 2 trillion this year. It's not too bad. We forecasted one and a half trillion. So $500 billion rounding error never really hurt anyone when you're looking at $33 trillion in debt, but we're going to get out of it. So price stability, uh, labor markets, and I guess we'll add in uh, limiting the interest the U.S. government pays. You have a third mandate. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, Biden already said he's gonna he's gonna not only not <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> he's gonna eliminate uh, student loan debt and also our, our our national debt. It's just gonna evaporate. We're just gonna snap our fingers and just do a resetting. Call that default. Yeah, no one's call gonna, that a ju no, debt jubilee. No one's gonna care. No, it'll be fine. All right, Kevin. Um, you are all, you are Harold Daggett. Did I pronounce that right? The head of That's the close enough. the head of the union that represents dock workers at U.S. East and Gulf Coast ports. Are you going on strike at the end of September, or are you going to cause a major inflation issue from the supply side? Asking for a seventy-seven percent increase over six years. 
Look, Tom, what you have to understand is our dock workers are severely underpaid, having gotten the raises commensurate with the work that they provide. We handle all the cargo in the entire East Coast as well as the Gulf. Do you know how many imports come in through these ports every day? Do you remember all those boats being stacked up? There's no boats stacked up right now, but they will be stacked up and we'll reroute them around to other parts of the country and other parts of the world if we don't get what we need. We're only asking for a small 77% increase over the next six years. That's barely, you know, chump change for a lot of these companies. Uh, it's, it's not a lot to ask. And yeah, you know what? Part of the fact is there will be inflation. There's not going to be as many goods available if we can't get them off the boats because we're not being comp properly comp compensated. So, you know, I heard your last guest, uh, you know, Jerome Powell, he's going to have a tough time when inflation reaccelerates because we shut down shipping. Wow. Pay us. So you just, you just, you don't care about the economy. You're saying, you know what, give us what we want or else. This is supply and demand. We live in a capitalist country. And you know what? We're valuable and we need to be treated properly and paid commensurately. Wow. You know, I can't disagree with you on that. Get ready. <laughs> All right, Tom, you were Tom Lee, uh, Tom Kennedy and Tom Lee today. You recently said the S&P 500 will hit 15,000 by the end of the decade, which, you know, by all counts is about five and a quarter years away. Um, can you walk us through this prediction? How, how do you get to basically not even a triple anymore? Cause we're almost hitting S and P 6,000. But I remember when a guy on this podcast predicted it was going to hit 5,000 and was almost laughed out of the room. So 15,000, what do you have to say? Listen, first off, people have to stop calling me fat Elvis. I don't know where that came from, but I take, I take insult to <laughs> it. A pretty thin guy. And, Are you talking about you? And, Tom Lee. Tom Lee. I am Tom Lee. I'm, I'm working. Tom Lee's I'm, been I'm a pretty thin guy. I'm I don't work, know. I'm working on my weight. Uh, listen, I, I, I call bull. I call, I'm very bullish in the market overall. You know, I got Bitcoin at 150,000 by year end. We still, you know, we still have three months. I, I almost guarantee it's going to go there. 15,000 on the S and P is nothing. That is only, what is that? Earnings per share, $833 a share. At a 19 valuation. What are we talking about? Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, a little above average, but, you know, not crazy. Listen, I, myself, Tom Lee, I am, I am a perma bull. I don't care about dips in the market. I'm very aggressive. I'm going to continue to call for new highs in the market on all asset classes every day. Because you know what, Kevin? One of those is going to hit. And when it does, I'm going to be all over the papers as the hero. And if it doesn't, no one's going to remember. It's like the guys who called the housing crisis. Who They've got an, this stuff, right? Listen, Kyle Bass was one of the few that called the housing crisis. He's been short China ever since, and he's gotten every single bet wrong. But all it takes is just one, that one guy to call the, the crypto to hit 150. And when it does, I will be the crypto king. Yeah, position yourself properly, and you can go for a nice triple payday. So we'll see. I, I like the rosy outlook. I don't know if in five years it's going to happen. I guess I hope that it does. It's gonna happen, Kevin. You just you just wait. We'll do a we'll do a podcast in, in five years when I lose a little bit of weight. See you, uh, January 1, 2031 or twenty thirty. It's we'll we'll see what the end of the decade is officially. Yeah, it depends where we'll the start back is. at zero. <laughs> you need an extra twelve months. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh you are John Foley. You recently lost two billion on paper with a B, and now are selling houses and other assets. Your holdings are still 22 million, so you're not going back to zero. But how does it feel to lose a fortune and the life you had built? Well, Tom, I, I helped to create a company called Peloton. You may have heard of it. Everyone in 2020 wanted one of my bikes, and we built out the infrastructure to make sure we could meet that demand. Um, and then less people wanted our bikes a few years later. So we may have built out a little too much infrastructure, taken on a little too much uh, appetite and uh, didn't quite materialize, but we have a great product and it'll be back. Uh, in the meantime, yeah, I've got uh, some capital calls and some other things I got to do. And I had to sell a house that, you know, it's a nice beach house, but I I'll be okay. And, you know, you peak, it's kind of, I, I feel a little bit like Icarus. Uh, I was flying high and then I got a little too close to the sun. I had a couple billion dollars, you know, unlimited, you know, funds. That's a pretty good feeling, but to go back to 22 million from 2 billion, uh, you know, I'm going to be okay. So I'm practicing gratitude. Uh, I'm being thoughtful. I'm going to rebuild and uh, I'll be back. But you learn a lot about losing a fortune, uh, probably more than you did about making a fortune. 
You know, I just don't understand. Did you think your bikes were eventually going to be able to fly? I mean, how did you not sell out <laughs> when your stock just quadrupled well, overnight? Tom, we we have, well, you know, when you're the founder, when you're the CEO, when you're an executive, you can't just sell your shares. I mean, you have to be thoughtful of what it represents to the market. So I was never in a cash out, but have you tried our rowing machine? Have you tried our <laughs> treadmill? Have you noticed that all of our clothes are on back order? The demand is still there. We have a great product. It's going to go really well. Um, I hear that people love it. And, uh, you know, walking outside will become inhospitable as climate change takes over. So be prepared. Well, I'll tell you what, John, uh, talking about tax planning, it sounds like you're going to have a whole lot of write-offs uh, for future years. So I guess you can look at that as a, as a positive. Yeah, I'm probably never paying taxes again, which is great. <laughs> All right. Uh, would you like to be Jumana or Leonard? Let's see. Tom, how about let's see. We'll, we'll go to Leonard next. So we can finish with the other one. All right. You are Leonard Riggio. Uh, he recently passed, so I, I welcome him back. We're excited to, to honor his memory here. You were the founder of Barnes & Noble. You basically invented the modern bookstore, which now is not really existing. But it was, uh, like Starbucks, a third place in the 90s um, where people went besides the office and uh, home. Uh, really impressive in 1971, you took a million two loan and you turned it into a national chain of stores. Your company was stopped by the FTC late in your career. Uh, and then you weren't able to pivot into technology. And you kind of said, look, we're a bookstore. We're not a tech company, uh, but you ended life as an art collector. Uh, what was the best part? What, what, what do you got to share? You know, the best part, Kevin, you know, there's this little thing called Amazon today. And I, I believe that Jeff Bezos would not be Jeff Bezos if he didn't try to put me out of business and compete. And I think I gave him all his good ideas. So you can thank me for all your same day delivery needs and everything that takes place in the e-commerce world today. But with that being said, even if you don't take that stance, I did extremely well for myself. I listen, I made out very well, very, very well. I went public. I got bought out by a hedge fund who took us public. I owned a good portion of that uh, of that stock. And the best part was I created a bookstore from almost nothing, a million dollar loan created into over 488 stores worldwide. And I take a lot of credit for what's going on today in the e-commerce market. Yeah, well, you always were better than borders. So you can look down at them and... You know, it's funny, the FTC really towards the end, right before things turned on you, was coming down that you were too powerful, you know, too uh, dominant in the marketing, charged you with monopolistic behavior. And then shortly thereafter, your company basically ceases to exist. So government always late to the party uh, in blocking mergers and other stuff. All right. I'll... Got one more. Are you ready to be done? No, let, let, let's do it. Uh, Jumana. Jumana Sal Salihin. Is that how you pronounce that? Are you, are you asking I'm, my I'm name? asking your own name, Mr. Jumana. You know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you who I am, Tom. I am the chief economist and head of investment strategy at Vanguard Europe. Now you can ask your question. All right. Well, you say the bond market and stock market will have similar returns over the next 10 years, but bonds have a quarter of the volatility. So I ask you, are bonds better value than stocks over the next decade? I think so. I think this is the case for a diversified portfolio, not just of diversified equities. But if you look at, especially pre-cut, maybe they say a month ago, uh, long-term expectations for intermediate bonds or long duration bonds, whether they be government bonds or municipal bonds or even corporate bonds, and you were having yields of four to 6% somewhere in that range. So we'll call it five. And in the future, you expect our star, like Jerome Powell was talking about, go down to three. We got basically two points down on that. So we're going to see 20, 24% increase over the next 10 years in the principal value of those bonds. And meanwhile, you're going to clip all those coupons. So pretty steady, pretty easy ride. Um, you know, when we looked back at high interest rate regimes, what we found is that they had very similar returns over the next 10 years. But what we also found is you didn't have to go for the wild roller coaster ride that you get in equities. So when I look out and say, you know, what's the best value over the next 10 years? Say, well, if I'm going to end up with 7 or 8% as my annualized return, do I want to lose half my money twice? You know, two out of 10 years, stock market crashes. Bond market doesn't crash that often. Usually, you know, our worst year is down nine. Now, we did have a weird 2022 in bonds, but. Otherwise, I mean, tell me why. Uh, why would you want to go have all this risk, make 7% in the end? I don't know. I feel like you're just talking your book a bit. I have a feeling that if you look at your your investors, you got the majority of them in bonds. I could be wrong. 
look, we have a diversified strategy <laughs> at Vanguard. We focus on cost and keeping those low. Um, and in Europe, you know, we have some good companies that pay high dividends as well as some really high quality bonds. So, you know, what do you want? Do you want to make 10 in stocks, but have to go on this wild ride where you lose half your money twice in a decade? Or do you want to sit quietly in bonds and have a nice boring ride, but, you know, maybe make one or 2% less, but Hey, you never have to look and say, where did half my money go in a quarter? All right, Mr. Jumana. All right, that's it. Good, We're done. good role play. Um, Put the costumes away. Just for the record, I'm not a fan of Tom Lee, as you could as you could all tell. And he does. I'm not sure you're thinking of the right guy. Tom Lee's a pretty trim looking dude. No, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Tom Fat Lee, Ellen. the guy's on CNBC every day calling for bull markets. It's insane. Yeah, he's look at his look at uh, the 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 trollers. I, I he, guess. Yeah, if he's, you see him in person, he's actually a pretty he, trim guy. But I do see the. Uh, he's got a chubby I face. See the, uh, I see the. <laughs> you see the fat Elvis <laughs> resemblance. I see. Right? The, I see the Elvis <laughs> resemblance. The first picture that pops up on Google when you look it up. Yeah, uh, just Google Tom Lee. You'll have a good laugh. Someone said that and just called. Yeah, it's and, unfair to him. Though. It is unfair. It's kind of like some of those NBA players who are in like unbelievable, you know, shape, but they have a round face, and you're like, oh, that guy looks out of shape. It's like. I don't know, man. That doesn't look out of shape to me. He plays in the NBA. Yeah, but. I'm I'm not a fan of Tom Lee because there are guys that just are constantly they're they're long only investors, so they're always bullish, and you know eventually they're always going to be right, but they're wrong a lot, and you know he's a he's a tough analyst to follow. Yeah, I see your Michael Lewis going infinite book behind you. Did you see? Uh, mm -hmm. We'll say the number two person of that company. Yeah, she's got two years, all kinds of trouble. And two years and eleven Did billion. You see eleven billion. Yeah. Do you have any idea how much she actually made to have eleven billion to well look get, look where back? look where crypto's is, crypto is right now? I mean, I think she probably does have eleven billion. I don't think they would throw that number out there if she didn't have it. But it, it could be a rounding error. Maybe uh, maybe she needs some tax planning. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna need a couple of attorneys. Before yeah. She needs tax <laughs> oh God. Good thing she has eleven billion to pay them. Yep. All right. All right. See you later, Tom. Yeah. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.